So welcome to everyone to the 17th annual Norman R. Say lecture. My name is John Morris, and I have the privilege of being the director of the Knight Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Before I make some introductions, just want to go through some housekeeping tasks. Please silence your electronic devices. If you parked in the Metro garage, we have a validation ticket that you can use so you don't have to pay for it. There will be a table outside this room for the Metro and North Garage uh, parking validations. In your program is a evaluation form. Please um, help us improve by uh, filling it out and leaving it with us. There'll be a reception following the lecture downstairs uh, hosted by the Knight ADRC with the support of our partners, Lynx Incorporated. And I would like to recognize all members of the Knight ADRC's African American Advisory Board, including the SAE Planning Committee, including our African American Advisory Board Chair, Douglas Petty. Doug is raising his hand. Thank you, Doug. Arlene Moore Ross, Richard King, Murda Spencer, Andrew Denny, and Joy Ballsberry. We also this week are pleased to host a team from Harvard Medical School led by uh, Jonathan Jackson, the forever team that is interested in recruitment, uh, engagement and retention and is visiting uh, Alzheimer's disease research centers to understand what they are doing at present and what they might want uh, to do in the future and develop some evidence-based recruitment, engagement, and uh, retention strategy. So uh, Jonathan, you wanna raise your hand and introduce Marissa Reynolds, Allison Lane, and Nicole Teka from Harvard. Thank you so much for coming. It's a real privilege for me to uh, introduce uh, to the podium in just a moment, a uh, Beverly Wendland, who is provost and executive vice chancellor for academic affairs at Washington University. Uh, Dr. Wendland uh, graduated with a degree in bioengineering from the University of California, San Diego, first in her family to complete college went from San Diego to Stanford, where she got her doctoral degree in neuroscience in 1994, did a postdoctoral fellowship, and then joined the faculty in the Department of Biology at Johns Hopkins University in 1998. She was interested in exploring cellular processes using yeast as a model system. She rose through the ranks at Hopkins and became Dean of the Krieger School of Arts and Sciences in 2015, and one of her major efforts was to enhance the diversity of faculty and students and to encourage an inclusive environment. We were fortunate to bring her to Washington University as provost in January 2020, just before the pandemic, but she already has made a mark. And some of you have seen recently her strategic vision for Washington University to establish the university and St. Louis as a global hub for solutions to the deepest societal challenge. Will you join me please? Oh, I forgot something. Norman Say was very sensitive to whether Washington University was as committed as the Knight ADRC to the ideas of diversity, inclusion and belonging and so who provided welcoming remarks was sort of a litmus test for, uh, for Norman. Uh, and he would be absolutely thrilled today that Provost Wendland is here. So please join me in welcoming Beverly to the podium. Well, thank you for for the introduction, John. And I'm I'm actually I'm very touched, and I really appreciate your kind words. So, um, good afternoon. I'm really pleased to be here with all of you um, to um, help get this 17th annual Norman Arce lecture kicked off. 
And I really appreciate the opportunity to share this space with all of you at the medical campus. And also a special welcome to everybody who's joining us remotely, hello. Um, so this really is a wonderful time for our university and our city to celebrate Norman Arce. And um, as John mentioned, last Monday, WashU unveiled our university strategic plan, which is called Here and Next. And um, we've got a great green logo, and I now have a green attire to be branded <laughs> for our strategic plan logo. And um, as John mentioned, our strategic vision really is an ambitious one, and I want to I want to say it all to you in its entirety. For our strategic vision, we will mobilize our research, education, and patient care to establish WashU and St. Louis as a global hub for transformative solutions to the deepest societal challenges. And I just get goosebumps every time I read that, and you can imagine how many times I've read that over the last year. <laughs> Um, but I'm really, I'm motivated by this strategic vision and I hope that you all are as well. One of the things that is an important element of this is Wash U and St. Louis. Partnerships like those that Norman Say worked to forge are at the core of our strategic plan. With this strategic plan, we aim for Wash U to become the leading model for how a university can partner with local communities to resolve the most pressing problems of our day and how local solutions can have a global impact. Our threefold mission of research, education, and patient care at WashU positions our university to contribute to an equitable and vibrant future for our region. And a commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion runs through our entire strategic plan. And we are truly committed to equity, diversity, and inclusion across all three elements of our university's mission, research, education, and patient care. Partnerships, partnerships like the ones that we seek to build with our strategic vision cannot happen overnight. And such partnerships have not always characterized our relationship with our city and our community partners. WashU's history is not uncomplicated. We have done much to advance prospects for our region, and we also have fallen short of our highest ideals at times. So as we look ahead to contribute to meaningful, lasting change, we should also look to our past, and that includes to work with the likes of Norman Arce. For us at WashU, that, need, that work needs to begin with humility. As WashU moves forward, we hope that our approach to authentic, responsible, and sustainable partnerships with our local community will be the example for other institutions in higher education. So it's kind of fortuitous that we have our Harvard colleagues here. Um, through community-driven approaches and in collaboration with new and existing partnerships, we want to foster community-engaged teaching, learning, and research through centralized community-oriented resources and infrastructure. This is one of the key pillars of our plan. So I, um, I hope that those of you who are familiar with our plan are getting excited about where you can fit into it. And for those of you who are not familiar with our plan, I encourage you to find out more so that you can come on board with the exciting things that we're trying to do. So I'll stop here and I just wanna say, I feel so fortunate to be here this evening and I look forward to continuing to celebrate Norman Say through this lecture, through our work together, and then all the years to come. So thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much, Beverly. Our 17th Norman R. Say lecture is Reagan Durant, MD, MPH who presently is professor of medicine at the University of Alabama School of Medicine and associate dean there for diversity and inclusion. He also is the medical director for the Cooper Green Mercy Health Services Authority uh, in the county where University of Alabama Birmingham Medical School resides. Dr. Durant did his undergraduate education at Howard University, had a major in biology, then he did his medical school at Johns Hopkins, 
completing, uh, getting his MD in the year 2000. Then he went to Duke for an internal medicine residency. And from 2003 to 2005, Harvard School of Public Health, where he got his master's of public health. He left Harvard for Birmingham and joined the faculty at University of Alabama, Birmingham, 2006 as assistant professor in the division of preventive medicine. His interests are in addressing disparities in healthcare, increasing diversity in the clinical and research workforce, and developing strategies to increase participation in clinical trials by persons from groups who are underrepresented in research. He has received many honors for his teaching and for his work in health and representation. And it's notable that he is the current principal investigator at the University of Alabama a School of Medicine of the RICMAR there, the Deep South Resource Center for Minority Aging Research. So Reagan, if you'll come to the podium, I have a plaque to present to you and I'm sure someone is gonna take a photograph. <laughs> So this reads the 17th annual Norman R.C. lecture, October 11th, 2022, presented in appreciation to Reagan Durant, MD, MPH, by the Charles F. and Joanne Knight Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Reagan, thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Morris, thank you so much for uh, not only the invitation, uh, but such a uh, wonderful uh, invitation as well as, uh, as a wonderful introduction, excuse me, as well as uh, the plaque. Uh, thank you all for uh, coming out this afternoon. Uh, I hope that this will be uh, a thought provoking presentation. Uh, I uh, have been instructed to let the folks on uh, Zoom know that uh, you can put questions in the chat. And then once the uh, presentation is over, uh, we, I will then look in the chat and try to address those questions as well as uh, taking questions here from the audience as well. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Yeah. Clicker. By the way, the insert up there says, Melissa Schiffer, but this is not <laughs> All right, so first, just disclosures. Um, I received funding from NIH and PCORI, and uh, I don't have any financial uh, disclosures or conflicts uh, related to the material that I'm gonna present. So I wanted to start off uh, with just an acknowledgement of Norman R.C. Uh, prior to being uh, invited for this talk, I really was not familiar with Dr. Say's uh, gigantic legacy I uh, had an opportunity to uh, read a bit about him. Uh, not surprisingly, it's not hard to find information on him. Uh, it's quite a bit that has been written about him. Uh, and uh, as you all know, I'm sure you're very familiar with his biography. It's really quite amazing. Uh, some of the things that, uh, that he did in his lifetime from serving uh, in core Congress on racial equality from a very young age, uh, being uh, a, uh, uh, employment officer in uh, Maryland for the Department of Health and Education and Welfare, and then relocating back to University of Missouri St. Louis, where he held a number of administrative posts, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, culminating in his leadership of the Office of um, Economic Opportunity. And then finally, uh, his service uh, here at Washington University in St. Louis, uh, which is the reason why we're all here today. Uh, it's, he was the inaugural chair of the African-American Advisory Board. Uh, I chose this picture, there are many pictures of him online, but I thought this picture of him shaking hands with King was apropos. Uh, there are a number of national luminaries that we're all familiar with. And I think sometimes uh, some of the uh, 
individuals who did mammoth amounts of work on a local level uh, get overlooked. Uh, and I think it's really wonderful that you all honor Dr. Say's legacy uh, here um, uh, with not only with this lecture, but uh, I imagine in many other ways as well. Uh, you know, I, this was a fascinating picture. Uh, again, I don't have to, I, I'm preaching to the proverbial choir here. Uh, you all are probably very familiar with his uh, work in um, essentially taking sit-ins, which typically were in lunch counters and restaurants and transferring it that model to Jefferson Bank to get them to hire uh, black tellers, particularly in those areas that uh, were not inhabited by, typically inhabited by African-Americans. Uh, I think this is uh, Mr. Say here on the back uh, right, uh, uh, coming out of a uh, courthouse after, uh, after being arrested. And uh, you know, I just want to acknowledge that uh, any uh, milestones that I might happen to achieve, I recognize rest on the foundation uh, built by persons like Mr. Say and others. And I don't take that for granted. And uh, I uh, really do appreciate being invited to speak here in a lectureship that bears his name. So again, thank you. So uh, let's talk a little bit about representation of African-Americans in Alzheimer's disease trials. So uh, as uh, Dr. Morris said, I am uh, the 17th uh, uh, lecturer and I'm going to presume that my 16 uh, predecessors uh, probably made more than an adequate uh, case, probably more eloquently than I uh, ever could about the need for representation uh, of African-Americans in Alzheimer's disease trials. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here. Uh, this is basically uh, a table from a systematic review uh, done uh, looking at the representation of African-Americans in uh, AD trials. And uh, the most important piece of information here is this column. And you can see these are, this is the representation of African-Americans in those trials. You can see a couple of outliers, close to 30% here, uh, over 30% in these two, but most of them you can see are down around 10% or significantly fewer, significantly lower than 10%. And this is despite the fact that African-Americans are one and a half, two times more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease com uh, compared to white individuals. So the bottom line here is that there's been some progress, but still quite a ways to go to make sure that these study populations mirror the clinical populations that uh, many of you, I suspect, see on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think that when we ponder um, minority recruitment in clinical trials, we have to think about the pathway to study enrollment. And this is a model that was put forth by Jean Ford uh, and a group at uh, Hopkins and really was developed in the context of cancer, but I think it actually applies uh, to many uh, disease and research contexts. And I'm gonna draw your attention down here to the bottom. And they really pointed out three uh, junctures along this pathway that lead people to being in, into clinical trials. That first juncture is awareness. So it, it's, sort of stating the obvious, but you have to be aware that there is an opportunity to participate to even get to a point where you're uh, going to be in a trial. And this awareness oftentimes is triggered by someone telling you. Obviously, there are instances where people put out flyers and that sort of thing, but by and large still, many of, uh, most people become aware of trials by virtue of someone telling them. Uh, and the next juncture is opportunity. So once you're aware, uh, you have to be offered an opportunity to participate. Again, most trials are not, I know we see flyers with little pull downs, but those are probably uh, the outliers. The more uh, common scenario is that someone identifies you as potentially being eligible, does some sort of screening and then offers an opportunity to participate. And that occurs in this step. And then finally, it's incumbent on the person being offered an opportunity to accept or refuse. And it's really uh, these three junctures that go into uh, whether or not uh, you know, there's success achieved in recruiting or enrolling someone into a clinical trial. And of course, at each one of those junctures, there are a number of barriers and promoters that uh, impact each one of those steps for awareness, opportunity, and acceptance. And this is oftentimes a very useful framework uh, that we can utilize to think about 
uh, minority recruitment and where things go wrong and where we can do better. So where do we start looking? So one of the things when we we're thinking about framing this problem is, um, you know, where do we, where do we, um, where do we start looking? Uh, in the, I suspect there's some neurologists in the room and in your parlance, it's where's the lesion, right? And um, if, if you're not a neurologist, I'm sure one of them will explain to you after, uh, <laughs> after this talk. Um, we oftentimes tend to home in on the patient or the potential participant. And this is true not only in the context of thinking about minority participation in clinical trials, it's true honestly uh, in health disparities in general. Uh, we think about what is it about the patient that's leading to these disparate outcomes that we're seeing. And while that oftentimes is a well-intentioned effort, it sometimes can inadvertently lead to uh, this syndrome of blaming the patient. So this is the only place we need to look because all the things that are going wrong with this group of people is inherent to that group or inherent to those individuals. And of course, that's not the case. It sounds absurd as I say it out loud, but, it, but in the way that we approach the problem, we can almost sort of um, implicitly suggest that that's the case. And so in addition to actually focusing on the patient, we also need to focus on these other uh, factors or groups that uh, influence uh, trial recruitment. And of course, it, it, the investigators and the scientists, so the people actually doing the studies, uh, the trial itself, so how is the trial designed and what impact does that have on people's ability to participate or willingness to participate? And then hospital and uh, research institutions as well. So are there broader institutional policies or structures that uh, impact uh, recruitment of uh, anyone, uh, but specifically minorities? And what we find is that there are a number of, um, a number of factors that have an impact in all, at all of these levels uh, from patient all the way up to hospital or research institution and they all influence one another. And so we have to be mindful when we think about this problem to really make sure that we're looking at all of these levels. So toward that end, um, we embarked on an analysis, a qualitative analysis uh, using interviews uh, approximately um, seven years ago. And uh, we had a consortium of cancer centers. So this was all done in the context of minority participation in cancer clinical trials. And we uh, had a consortium of five, cent five cancer centers, uh, ours at UAB, uh, Hopkins, uh, MD Anderson, University of Minnesota, and uh, UC Davis in California. And among those uh, five cancer centers, we conducted 91 interviews. And we, uh, those interviews span different groups, which you see uh, here in this table. And uh, we interviewed cancer center leaders. Uh, so these were cancer center directors or associate directors. We interviewed principal investigators. So these were people who had at least three years of experience as PIs. And then we uh, interviewed research staff. So these are the people, not PIs, but these are the legions of people that are actually doing the research, recruiters, study coordinators, uh, and the like. And we also interviewed referring clinicians. And so these were people who were not necessarily primarily doing research uh, and actually spending over 50% of their time uh, seeing patients, but actively referring patients to clinical trials uh, during in, as a, a part of their clinical duties. And we asked uh, these individuals about their perceptions about uh, barriers to minority recruitment. And we really found some interesting things. And I'm not gonna go through this whole slide because there's a lot of information here. But what we did find is um, that not surprisingly, um, all four of the groups mentioned uh, distrust in very high proportions, as you can see in some groups, almost 90% uh, of them mentioned uh, distrust. Uh, they also mentioned limited transportation needs. And it's interesting because you can see there's some variation between the groups. Uh, not all of them mention them to the same extent. Uh, language uh, discordance was another, low education levels, and uh, there are a number of others. And what we found is that this really does mirror uh, some of the uh, same barriers when we ask patients. And that there's a preponderance of literature uh, 
available taken from the perspective of patients. But many of these things were uh, very similar to what the uh, professional stakeholders mentioned. And we found the same to be true when we looked at facilitators of minority recruitment, uh, increasing uh, awareness of opportunities uh, was mentioned uh, in large proportions by all the groups, uh, establishment of rapport. Uh, so trying to establish rapport with individuals uh, was also mentioned by um, three, but not all four of the groups. And same pattern here, we saw that many of these uh, things that they mentioned, again, mirrored what we were finding in the, uh, when we looked at prior uh, investigations among patients. Uh, so there is some uh, sense of, um, of overlap here, uh, but it was important for us to ask these professional stakeholders, because again, so many of the other uh, investigations and so many efforts oftentimes zero in on the patient uh, exclusively. One of the other analyses that we did uh, in this qualitative data uh, was looking at bias and minority recruitment. So uh, we think quite a bit about bias in clinical care and in clinical context. I think that uh, we're, it's still a bit of a uh, burgeoning um, area of exploration in uh, the context of research. And so we wanted to explore it based on um, some of the uh, response data that we had. And we actually found quite a few things uh, that, uh, that came up uh, across our stakeholders. And we uh, came up with five themes that basically uh, really summarized uh, our findings. And those themes are listed on the left. And if you'll indulge me, I'll uh, share some of these with you. Uh, one of them was uh, interactions with potential minority participants were perceived to be challenging. And we had quotes, so these are actual quotes verbatim from, uh, from our uh, respondents, from our 91 respondents. Uh, African-Americans, I think, have less knowledge. We take a little bit more time to explain to African-Americans. I think they have more questions because we know that they, are, that they are not more knowledgeable. So I think it takes time. They have a lot of questions. So this is an actual response that we got and, and, and it reinforces that theme. And I, I, I predicted that there were gonna be some groans and some head shaking. <laughs> Um, but you know, I, I, I think it was quite telling uh, that uh, these these were some of the responses that we were uh, that we were getting. Uh, one, our next theme: potential minority participants are not perceived to be ideal study candidates. So uh, in this one, this first one from a research staff member is actually acknowledging that there's physician bias and says physician bias. I think it's huge. I don't have any data to tell you this, but my thought is that I think physicians think about whether or not the patient would comply with the study. So that's someone who's sort of acknowledging that there is some, some measure of bias. Uh, this person uh, is making sort of a sweeping generalization. I see that degree of altruism more in Caucasian women than I do in African-American women. So again, uh, a bit of um, stereotyping there. And, and in that sense, uh, reinforcing this perception, at least on this person's part, that. Uh, African-Americans may not be ideal study candidates and specifically African-American women compared to, uh, to white women. And uh, the next theme was the combination of clinic-based barriers and negative perceptions of minority study participants leads to providers withholding clinical trial opportunities for potential minority participants. Um, here, the uh, exemplary quote was, I don't know if it's more them or me because I'm uncomfortable. One of my own personal biases, if I'm going to do the study and I know have, I have to enroll minorities, have I really had a conversation with myself? Am I really going to work? Am I really going to do the work to be able to make, to have a buy-in and to really connect with somebody and to really have a trust factor so that people understand? So this one is interesting. It's someone who is self-aware enough to know that he or she is uncomfortable, but we can easily see where that level of discomfort could be an impediment to that person trying to enroll African-Americans. Uh, in a clinical trial. Uh, this uh, next theme, when clinical trial recruitment practices were tailored to uh, minority patients, addressing misconceptions to build trust was a common strategy. Uh, this person uh, says, I try anytime I'm speaking with an African-American patient to be aware of the history of the abuses that have taken place in this country, particularly in the African-American population. So this is someone who tries to uh, appreciate the context that um, some African-Americans are viewing uh, uh, invitations to enroll in trials and perhaps quite frankly, the whole healthcare endeavor at large and, and trying to be sensitive to that. 
And then lastly, for our last theme, for some respondents, race was viewed as irrelevant when screening and recruiting potential minority participants for clinical trials. This person says, I don't view the recruitment of African-American patients any differently than I do any patients. The other person says, I do think that there is an economical educational issue which transcends a minority issue. It's more of an economic thing. So in this first quote, you have someone who basically is uh, suggesting that there be a race neutral approach and uh, I treat everybody the same. In the uh, second quote, you have someone here who is acknowledging that uh, any differences that uh, may be perceived are not necessarily due to race and there's nothing inherent about African-Americans. There may be other factors at play, socioeconomic status being one of them. And so we really thought that these were really fascinating because in so many instances, you know, the best we can do perhaps is to measure implicit bias. And this is sort of what we all is going on in, in all of our subconsciouses. And, and we, um, it's very difficult to measure that. There are scales, there are um, uh, certain tests uh, that can be used to measure it. Uh, certainly when we ask, uh, I, I know physicians as a group about bias, uh, no physician says he or she is biased. We all say, no, I'm not biased. And that's probably not just true of physicians, but I am uh, familiar with that literature. So it was fascinating to get such unvarnished, uh, though shocking in some cases, unvarnished responses from, from these participants. Uh, what we found is, is somewhat obvious. Uh, negative stereotypes clearly can preclude offers of trial participation of minority participants. Uh, we have to uh, acknowledge all types of bias, conscious and unconscious, and we have to make sure that they're acknowledged by the actual individuals harboring those thoughts. So it's not for us to, the rest of us to acknowledge them and then try to work around them. Everyone has to acknowledge that they exist and everyone has to do some level of work, some amount of work to um, essentially remove them from the equation as we're thinking about who should be in a trial and who shouldn't, who, who shouldn't be offered an opportunity to be in a trial. Race neutral is not really laudable or helpful. I understand that there may be some people who are well-intended and say, I treat everybody the same, but we're not asking for everybody to be treated the same. We're asking for everybody to be treated equitably. So in the same way that we treat patients, we don't treat every patient the same. We address each patient's unique needs. And we would ask the same, we would ask anyone involved in research to do the same with uh, potential participants. And we, you know, one of the things that we potentially uh, could do about this is um, perhaps place less reliance on the subjective nature of individual screening. Uh, and one of the ways that this could be done is if we uh, used automated ways to identify eligible patients using electronic data. That's not to say that, uh, that uh, AI and uh, certain electronic algorithms are not also prone to bias. We know in other sectors that we're finding that, that they indeed are. But I think this uh, very subjective uh, decision point where a patient is not being formally screened, uh, but whoever's making a decision is making a mental decision, oh, I'm going to proceed or oh, I'm not. That never gets documented. And that's what I think we have to work on minimizing such that uh, we can at least document uh, who's eligible, who's not. And if they didn't enroll in a trial, why not? Or if they weren't offered trial participation, why not? So let's pivot a little bit. Uh, I, I think so many of those lessons that we, we have learned in the cancer world uh, actually do apply um, in, um, in Alzheimer's trials. And let's talk a little bit about, specifically about the importance of family in Alzheimer's uh, trials. So, Obviously, um, Alzheimer's trials oftentimes uh, absolutely need family caregivers. So if we're talking about trials where um, patients uh, have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, even with mild cognitive impairment, oftentimes they will rely on someone else to assist with decision-making. And oftentimes that person is a family member. Uh, the AD participant, if the disease has progressed enough, may be completely unable to consent, in which case uh, the um, the uh, 
responsibility for providing consent would rest solely with a uh, family member or caregiver. And oftentimes in uh, AD trials, caregivers enrolled as a study partner in a dyad with the care recipient. So in the Alzheimer's disease world, the family and caregivers just take on such an outsized role relative, I think, to many other disease contexts. And the uh, even after enrollment, the caregivers really needed to assist the participant with compliance with study activities and reporting. So just even just doing the trial uh, really does require the assistance of the uh, family member or caregiver. And so, you know, let's consider some of the implications given that level of importance. Let's consider some of the implications of low African-American family participation in AD research. So uh, these are more general implications of uh, low participation of African-Americans in all trials. Uh, I'm sure you all are familiar with these. Uh, limited generalizability. So if we don't have African-Americans in trials, do we know if the results actually apply to this group as well. Uh, they're from a just justice perspective, uh, there are fewer opportunities to share in the risk and benefits of trial participation. And then from the standpoint of trying to uh, untangle uh, the underlying mechanisms of health disparities, if we don't have these subgroups in these studies, we can never really figure out what these mechanisms are. And so when we pivot to what are the AD specific implications. Um, we also have to extend that limited generalizability to the caregivers. So to the extent that caregivers are being enrolled as dyads or, or their caregiver reported outcomes, uh, we, there's limited generalizability there. Uh, we're also less able to enroll patients with advanced dementia. So someone with advanced dementia oftentimes could not get through a study if it were not for the family member of the care. So are we looking at having a disproportionately lower number of African-American participants simply because we can't get buy-in or engagement with the family member. And the data collection may be less feasible for reasons that we've already discussed. If there's uh, some uh, patient reported outcomes or caregiver reported outcomes, if they're not in the study, they can't report them. And then retention it, uh, in and of itself may be compromised. Are you really gonna have someone be able to stay in a study if you're not able to engage the family member or the um, or the caregiver. And so this actually also sort of warrants sort of taking a step back and thinking sort of what is family? Uh, this in, in the age of 23andMe and, uh, and amateur genealogy, uh, you know, I think we're all familiar with um, these sorts of charts and, and, and what they mean. If we assume for a minute that this is a uh, person who has uh, Alzheimer's disease. Um, you know, we can easily identify family members here. Uh, these don't show spouses. I wanted to kind of keep it simple, but presumably uh, this person has a parent uh, that's immediate family, uh, a sibling, um, children, and, and grandchildren as well. And uh, this uh, def defines family structure as, as many of us might think of it, particularly when we think about uh, uh, majority group here in this country. I think that's in stark contrast to what we think about when we uh, talk about African-American kinship networks. They tend to be more extended. Uh, and this really is a vestige uh, of uh, several um, centuries ago, um, African tribal culture. Uh, and it also is a vestige of uh, family structure here in, uh, in the US uh, under slavery uh, because those family bonds tended to be extended uh, to help withstand the duress of slavery. And also uh, those family, those biological bonds oftentimes were severed uh, by virtue of families being split up um, um, across different uh, plantations. So as a result, uh, we oftentimes, we African-Americans oftentimes uh, have extended uh, kinship networks that include uh, much extended families. So not just uh, a sibling, uh, but maybe cousins, aunts and uncles, uh, friends, uh, neighbors, uh, individuals in shared group membership. Uh, so this could be churches, could be civic organizations, and then even just the broader community. I mean, there are exa many, many examples of communities just adopting individuals, just saying, we're not gonna let this person fall by the wayside. Uh, and, and if you ask them, they will say that they're family. Uh, so we have to be mindful of this uh, different structure in African-Americans. Uh, to that point, uh, there was a 
uh, study of the uh, national study of uh, or analysis from the national uh, study on caregiving of about uh, 1500 uh, caregivers. And um, what they, oops, what they uh, found is that among the people who were, these were caregivers of people with, um, with um, dementia, what they found is that some element of dementia, uh, African-Americans were more likely in this column, were more likely to be taking care of someone who had probable dementia, and they were more likely to be taking care of someone who lived um, below the uh, poverty line, uh, significantly more so than whites, almost to the tune of three times more uh, likely. When we looked at the actual caregivers themselves, uh, you can see here they tended, they were more, they were less likely to be spousal caregivers. Uh, they um, were more likely to fall into the category of other family. They also were more likely to be uh, under the age of 65. And not surprisingly, as a result, they were more likely to be uh, working uh, 40 hours or more uh, weekly and, and less likely to be working 20 hours or less. So well, the picture that's being painted here is that we have an extended group of individuals, not necessarily biological relatives in every case, uh, oftentimes working age and um, oftentimes taking care of people who live uh, with limited financial resources. And despite that, uh, what's interesting is that the, the study found that um, African-Americans were more likely to um, report more uh, sub substantial perceived gains, more likely uh, than whites from caregiving. And uh, this is despite uh, facing um, more uh, financial strain, uh, but they reported less emotional strain. So it really does create this paradox of uh, race-based disparities among older adults with disabilities, despite the provision of higher intensity care with limited financial resources, uh, black caregivers perceive their situation more favorable. Uh, and this, is, um, this is fascinating. It's something that's been shown time and time again when we look at caregivers, caregiving uh, in, among African-Americans. Uh, when we think about framing trial participation, we have to think about family and caregivers as gatekeepers. Uh, it's understandable given the time, uh, energy and emotion that they invest uh, in their caregiving roles. And we have to understand that anytime we talk about an opportunity for trial participation, there really does have to be a bi-directional appraisal of, of, of that opportunity. So we, on the one hand, as researchers and scientists are saying, I've evaluated this opportunity. I think it would be good for you, uh, but we have to recognize that they are doing the same thing. We're not handing them a lottery ticket. Uh, it's not a no brainer for them. They in turn want to evaluate and make an assessment. And uh, we have to, when we think about the potential barriers, again, make sure that we take into account all four of these, uh, all five of these levels, not just focusing on the patient. And there really are some logistical things that we can do to make sure that we um, enhance the, the likelihood of engagement and ultimately, uh, if, if that is the goal, recruitment of African-American family and uh, caregivers, as well as the actual participant. We have to acknowledge that whoever's accompanying the patient um, to a clinic visit or study recruitment visit, we, we have to acknowledge them. So we can't walk into a room, see a third person sitting there and not say anything to them. And we have to ask them about the relationship. Uh, ask them, do they have a, a familial role or, or are they a friend or a caregiving role? Uh, inquire about caregiving in lay terms. If we say, are you a caregiver? They, they may interpret that question very differently than what we intend. So, you know, other ways to ask it, does this person assist you at home or else, elsewhere? If so, how? That will help us define that role as we think about uh, engaging that person, quite frankly, just in care, but secondarily, potentially in, in research. Uh, include them in the discussion. Uh, it, it's, it sounds readily evident, but I, I don't make any assumptions. I want to tell you all, not I want to tell Mr. Smith. Uh, so include the person in the conversation, the person sitting right there, particularly if you've already identified them as a, uh, as a, a caregiver. And in some cases, consider delaying recruitment discussions if a known family member or caregiver is not present. Uh, if you know that this person relies on that person, it, it, it's probably a coin flip in terms of whether or not uh, you're going to be able to convey the information that 
you want to convey uh, in a manner that you want to convey it without the person being there, particularly if it's someone who has um, some element of dementia. Uh, even, even among people without cognitive impairment, relaying scientific or research information is difficult enough. Uh, and so um, doing so without the caregiver there and then expecting it to be um, put in front of the caregiver in the way that you'd want it to is probably not gonna happen. And then you're probably not going to get the response that you'd like. And you just have to be mindful of that. And, and I know that you know, everybody's under time pressure with recruitment and seeing patients, but we have to be careful that we don't uh, put efficiency before efficacy, right? So what's, what's the point of doing it right then if, if we never really achieve the goal? So one of the ways that we have uh, tried to do this at UAB, and this is in the uh, context of, of cancer, is through patient navigation. So I, I suspect that many of you are familiar with the concept of patient navigation. These are uh, trained lay people who help to bridge the gap between the healthcare system and uh, patients. And oftentimes these individuals are uh, uh, selectively um, chosen uh, based on a shared cultural framework uh, with particular patient groups. And uh, they really do help to um, uh, fill in uh, what can be sometimes a chasm between uh, patients and providers, and, and oftentimes in this context, patients and uh, research teams. And uh, we started uh, our patient navigation program back in 2007. Uh, and at the time, only about 5.5% of all patients on trials were enrolled to the, were referred to the program. Uh, but uh, by 2014, that number had almost tri tripled. During that same time, the um, percentage of African-Americans comprising um, study populations in the cancer center, trial populations rose from 9% to 17%. So uh, it seemed to be quite effective uh, during that time. And so it, it, that, slide just spoke to how effective our patient navigation program uh, is. They have a wealth of, um, a wealth of experience uh, actually recruiting these patients and recruiting families and talking to families. And so I honestly asked them uh, as I was preparing for this talk, I said, what are some of the things that you all uh, encounter when you were working with families uh, on recruitment? And um, these are some of the things that, uh, that they mentioned to me. Trust has to be restored and built. I think they were being, uh, and these are quotes from them. I, I think that they were being intentional when they said restored. Uh, it's not that every uh, African-American uh, person or family member comes from a place of distrust, but you have to accept that that might be possible. So there might be a bit of restoration uh, in addition to trust building. Uh, respect is vital from the beginning to the end. That says it all. It has to be from the very outset and all the way through uh, the engagement. Removing all judgment based on outside appearances. So I think just making sure that we just accept people and take people at face value. Uh, and we have to put aside sometimes our cultural norms versus their cultural norms and accept the fact that uh, there may be a number of contextual in factors in their own environments that we have no um, idea about. And, and those factors may uh, impact any number of things. Uh, so we have to give people the benefit of the doubt. It's not about giving them the benefit of that. It's about being non-judgmental, uh, um, period, and, uh, and, and take people at face value. Uh, patients and their family members need time to process the information being presented to them. Again, this kind of goes toward the efficiency argument. Everyone's in a hurry, but we have to recognize that people need time to process this information. Oftentimes in the context of Alzheimer's when people are at the doctor, it's just honestly oftentimes not good news. And so um, we have to make sure that uh, we aren't trying to shoehorn this in as they're trying to process other perhaps more disappointing and at times even devastating news. Uh, patients and family members need to feel that they're valuable members of the clinical trial team. So again, you're, in many cases, you're recruiting a, a unit. Uh, even if you're not formally doing so for the purposes of the study. Practically speaking, oftentimes um, you are. And then we as healthcare providers really can learn so much from patients and their families if we would only listen to them. And that's, uh, they, they uh, have told me many anecdotes about uh, patients that were in studies and uh, 
investigators couldn't figure out what was going on. Navigator talked to the family, got some insights, and then suddenly, you know, voila, something was solved or discovered that answered the question. And so we have to uh, do a better job of listening to patients. These are two of our navigators, Angela Williams and uh, Kim Robinson. Uh, each of them has over 20 years of uh, experience as, nav as uh, navigators. They do tremendous work uh, for us. So let's talk a little bit about incentivizing African-American study um, partner participation. Um, one of the difficulties here is that, um, you know, in 2018, 50% of AD related costs in the US uh, from 157 to $215 billion annually uh, estimated uh, were the cost of informal caregiving uh, provided by over 15 uh, million American adults. And so the question arises, are we setting up a similar reliance on free labor and research? Uh, so we're asking them to be these caregivers in research and they're already not being paid uh, or compensated for that in real life. And so we really need to think more about how to mitigate the barriers uh, or enhance the value of study participation for study partners. Uh, one, of, one way may be financial incentives, but then the question becomes what's uh, appropriate. I think in so many instances, when we're thinking about those incentives, we think about being in a research study is a fairly low skill proposition. You're, you show up, you're asked to report things and you report them and that's, but we have to think about the lost opportunity cost. If someone is missing work to do that, then can we really pay them sort of what we would think about as sort of compensation for a low skill, you know, basically minimum wage sort of role when that person uh, is missing work where they would earn a much higher wage. And so we have to take that into account. Uh, another way we could think about it is directly offsetting caregiving responsibilities. So assuming that there's uh, it's not what's being studied and we're not contaminating the study condition, you know, can we offer respite care while they are participating? Is that a means of compensating? Um, again, to the broader point about not thinking just about patients or the caregivers or the study participants, we can think about um, study design. And there are a number of things here. I'm not gonna go through all of them uh, for the sake of time, but allowing for non-spousal partners. Uh, if we have studies that only have spousal partners, that's gonna uh, eliminate a lot of African-American uh, patients and, and uh, caregivers off the bat. Can there be shared caregiver roles in research context? So if there are multiple people uh, who are working together to, be, uh, a, to serve the role of caregiver, can they all participate and can we get it, gather information from all of them? Um, can we have after hours or weekend time for, to participate or include travel uh, reimbursement? Uh, from an institutional standpoint, can some of these services like travel uh, be provided across all trials and be provided by the institution? Uh, and can we formally recognize uh, family and caregivers when patients initiate care? Can we do a better job of that so that they already feel engaged? Uh, by the time we get to some sort of research context. And then there's a broader ecosystem and, and broader social policy. Uh, you know, we'd really love to see our funders, uh, whether it's NIH or foundations, include money for engagement and recruitment of family and caregivers, uh, just uh, as a matter of uh, course, uh, when making uh, funding awards. Oftentimes, when we try to look for those portions of our budget, which we can allocate to recruiting, those dollars oftentimes are very slim. Uh, yet uh, the funding sources want us to have representative populations uh, enrolled. Uh, you know, can we even think outside the box about FMLA? Uh, can F FMLA or other uh, employment policies uh, be used to cover research um, participation? Obviously it's used to cover healthcare, but as a society, if we want to see uh, some of these uh, diseases um, uh, cured or, or at least uh, with better treatments, uh, can we uh, ask employers uh, to uh, be more forgiving uh, to allow people to contribute to those efforts? So we've talked a lot about participation, but I think, you know, the ultimate goal really is getting to partnership. And so the table on the left is a, um, from a JAMA piece uh, on uh, continuous um, engagement, uh, community engagement. And there are a number of um, um, steps here in the uh, process from conceiving a research question all the way to disseminating information after the project is done, 
and then ways in which the uh, patient can be engaged at those various junctures. Here's some of the high points from uh, this table. When we think about the conception of ideas, we can solicit ideas uh, and topics with built-in reality check. So we wanna make sure that you know, what's being proposed as a topic is a priority to the people that are being studied. So it's nice if I sit in a room with my colleagues and come up with something that I think is very fascinating, but if it's not meaningful to them, then we have to maybe take a second look. Thinking about study design and, and execution, um, talking to patients and families and communities can inform data collection content and procedures. And we can even allow for input on analysis plan. And this may seem anathema to uh, the scientist in the room. Uh, for those of us who are not biostatisticians, we may reflect on the fact, I speak for myself, that sometimes it's even hard for us to follow sort of the intricate details of, it, uh, of an analysis plan uh, without the help of a biostatistician. But there is an opportunity to include even lay people uh, here, because again, the, the ultimate question is, you know, are these results plausible or believable? And so if we find something that's anomalous, uh, one way that we can figure out, you know, whether or not it really is represents, you know, our, a scientific truth of sorts uh, is by talking to the very people that we, uh, that we are studying. And then certainly in the translation phase, uh, do the results affect patients and their families? Are, they, are the results counterintuitive? And then how do we disseminate results to the lay public? Um, we oftentimes think about scientific journals as our first stop, but that can't be the only stop. We have to make sure that uh, the results that we find um, get disseminated further than that. And um, yeah. you know, this progression to more of a partnership uh, will allow for better understanding of the coping mechanisms of African-American caregivers versus uh, white um, uh, caregivers. So how is it that African-American caregivers, uh, despite some of the barriers, come away with um, uh, less um, emotional struggle uh, in caregiving, um, trying, to oops, trying to identify strategy for allocation of support services within kinship, kinship networks. So in these broader networks, can we help patients and their families and caregivers figure out how that time and effort should be allocated toward the benefit of the patient with respect to his or hers, Alzheimer's or dementia, and then just utilizing existing support networks. Uh, this is um, an aspirational slide, uh, but I think uh, very worthy as we think about participation and partnership. Um, we can think about um, engaging um, people living with dementia and care partners at all of these junctures. Um, just in terms of creating an open atmosphere to share knowledge, uh, being able to set priorities about what needs to be studied, uh, certainly uh, forming working groups and health panels uh, to give feedback, and then ultimately serving as co-investigators in research or at serving on advisory committees. And then, you know, even serving as principal investigators. So are there groups and, and, and individuals, particularly when we think about community-based grants or programmatic uh, awards who could take on a leadership role uh, and perhaps partner with academic centers, but perhaps not. But could we help to situate some of these individuals? Uh, I think moving toward that goal will help in many ways come up with uh, things that are far more feasible and far more sustainable because there'll be some measure of ownership uh, from the individuals uh, uh, who stand the most to benefit. And this is where we all should be headed. Uh, we, participation is important, but partnership is the ultimate goal because beyond that, it's, it's really about uh, our uh, journey toward health equity and uh, having uh, active partners uh, in that journey uh, is, is probably what's gonna be most effective. So with that, I will end and uh, take any questions. So it looks like the chat is empty. So I'm, ha <laughs> um, I'm, I'm happy to take questions through either means. You talked about the success of health navigators. What do you identify as the individuals that you paired up with as a health navigator? Yeah, so that's, an, that's a very good question. So when the program first started, 
the idea was um, to work um, specifically with African American um, potential African American trial participants. So the um, so strategically, uh, the navigators um, were African American uh, lay people uh, who lived in many of the communities uh, where many of our patients in the cancer center uh, hail from in Birmingham. And that's how they were initially chosen. They were trained and, uh, and these were people that were really kind of doing this already. So these were community members that um, you might call on if you wanted to try to arrange a meeting. Uh, in, in, in so many ways, this was second nature to many of them. Um, the, the interesting thing is that um, we about, about 10 years ago now, uh, maybe more recently than that, I wasn't directly involved with this grant, that we had a CMS uh, grant to look at navigation across the board. So at, for all comers, and actually found that it was cost effective. Uh, and so now the navigation program is much more robust to hardline funding in the cancer center and every patient can, um, can work with a navigator and they really are not necessarily matched uh, with an eye toward um, racial concordance. Uh, they're all in one pool and they are helping patients. And so we have navigators um, on the uh, clinical side uh, but then we still have our navigation program as well. Uh, this focuses specifically on research. Oh, thanks. So the question is when recruiting uh, in person or over the phone, what are some strategies we could use to check limit bias? So, you know, I, I think that um, the first thing is acknowledging that there, you have some bias uh, that may Again, seems self-evident, but I think it's an important step. And I, I think the other thing is uh, really being mindful that the person that you're speaking with may come from a different framework than you do uh, and may have a different worldview than you do. And that doesn't mean, you know, as many of you know, there's been a term that's been used in the last decade or so called cultural competency. And you talk to some, it's fallen out of favor in part because it suggests a fallacy that somehow we can become competent in every culture there is. And of course that's not possible. Uh, so the idea is not that you become an expert uh, in every cultural framework or every, or every you know, potential worldview. Uh, and of course those are innumerable. Uh, the idea is that you, you're aware that there may be differences and you um, approach people with a certain being non-judgmental and being open to the fact that their uh, framework may be different from yours and, uh, and going from there. And, and I think sometimes if there's a question that needs to be asked, people don't mind you asking. Uh, I, I, I think that is feasible. That it should not, there should not be an expectation that you recognize a difference and you can't inquire to get a better understanding of the difference. I think there is a respectful way to open up a line, a line of dialogue with, with someone. So if someone says, well, I have to, it, 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 this is a very crude example, but if someone says, well, I have, you know, just uh, based on my family, I have to ask, you know, my brother, uh, he's the oldest man in the family. Uh, I think that's okay to say, oh, well, I understand. Is there, is that a tradition in your family? There are ways to, to better understand that and, and not be judgmental, but to get an understanding of where the person is coming from. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Um, I'm gonna get, I see your hand raised, sir. I'm gonna come to you in just a second. Can you talk more about how transportation of participants and or their accessibility to the university site has been addressed over the course of your project? Uh, yes. So. One of the things that the navigators are armed with is travel vouchers. So one, you know, this talk could have been about the navigators, really. <laughs> they're, they're the ones uh, who are doing so much of this. One of the things that they did early on, when the, and those you saw where that line was down around 5%, were basically they had to kind of prove themselves um, for better or for worse. And they actually went out with local businesses and um, essentially negotiated uh, gifts in kind 
uh, for their program. And one of the companies, uh, I think a couple of companies at least, that they worked with were uh, cab companies. You, um, you can tell it was a while ago. Uh, uh, it wasn't Uber or Lyft, uh, but it was. they were cab companies and they would get vouchers and they had a certain allotment every month and then they could sort of uh, give these out. I, I think now UAB may have a, an official arrangement with Uber, I think, uh, and that's how they handle it today. But it really was going out and be, beating the pavement. They did that with um, cab companies. They did it with... Um, um, some local hotels, so people who are coming from far away. I suspect there are a number of people who come here for care who are probably from rural parts of the state, and uh, people needed to stay overnight or stay for several days. Um, so there were a number of those barriers that they really help patients to um, mitigate uh, just for uh, uh, being part of a um, study. So what is your perception of what potential participants expect in terms of personal research results? as opposed to study-wide results. Yeah, so does this affect recruitment? Yeah, so this is very interesting. Uh, I, I think to the extent we can give people personalized results, I think that's good. And I know just from being here today that a good bit of the work that's done at the Knight ADRC is around biomarkers. And so I would imagine in um, some of those contexts, there's an opportunity to give participants uh, individualized feedback. I think that helps a lot. Uh, because it gives makes them feel as if they're getting something uh, back in return. They're getting some information uh, back, and and you know, it, admittedly, by virtue of it being a study, that that information may not necessarily be actionable in the moment, but at least they're learning exactly what the investigator knows about them. So I, I think that is uh, very helpful. I think aggregate results, though, still are good because it gives people an idea about how the whole group did, and it also gives people an idea about what inferences ultimately will be drawn from the, um, from the study. I think all of us is a great example of this. So I, uh, I don't know if you all are a site for all of us, but um, it's the um, NIH sponsored study to uh, enroll uh, a million Americans for genotyping. And uh, it's going on all over the country. And uh, one of the um, benefits of being an all of us participant is that um, you can get um, specific genotyping information back uh, and you get a customized report. Uh, and so patients can, uh, who participate can get that. Yes, sir. Sure. So, so I think it depends on the disease context, honestly. Uh, I think there are some disease contexts where you find that, but in others not. So for instance, if you look at, if you look at prostate cancer uh, trials, um, African-American men oftentimes are overrepresented uh, in prostate cancer trials. But I think that's because that alarm bell has been ringing now for probably the better part of the last two decades in prostate cancer. So I think the take home message is that if we are intentional about recruiting certain groups, we can be successful. And so to the extent that there's any inherent um, barrier, and I, it's not inherent, but in, any barrier that you know, is related to, for instance, African-American men may be utilizing healthcare on the whole uh, less frequently than their female counterparts, um, it can be overcome if we're aware and intentional about those recruitment efforts. I think we're going to have to stop here. If people have questions or would like to come to the doctor to go ahead and do so. Uh, we have a reception downstairs. Let's give uh, a round of applause.